part of uh, this morning's event. Uh, we had a uh, very wide discussion after Milita Shunic's introduction and then uh, the great panel we had that Mirjana Anatomic led on Sweden, uh, Italy and, and Austria about the issue of integration. Uh, really a complex topic and I'm very glad that we have uh, Patrick Vey uh, from Paris, France. Hello, Yvan. Hello, Yvan. Bonjour, Patrick. Bonjour, Yvan. <laughs> you hear me? Yes. Good. So I will briefly introduce uh, Patrick uh, Vey, who is a senior research fellow at the French National Research Center uh, at the University of Paris, Panthéon-Sorbonne, and he also a senior research scholar in law at the Yale uh, Law School in the United States, focuses on comparative immigration, citizenship, and uh, church state law and policy. We actually also met a long time ago because uh, Patrick Vey was also uh, uh, related to the German Marshall Fund and the program that we had um, while I was there as well. Uh, Patrick is a renowned author, not only a research scholar, published uh, a number of, of books on these issues, and I think uh, is a privileged uh, interlocutor on the issues of immigration. We will have a uh, short uh, discussion uh, for about 15-20 minutes, and then I will open it up to the floor and we can ask questions. So, uh, Patrick, again, thank you for being with us, and let me uh, jump to the crux of the matter. Uh, we have asked our interlocutors here, what does it mean to be Swedish, Italian, uh, Austrian? Uh, so, the simple question is, what in based on, on your research uh, and extensive insight, uh, what does it mean to be French? Well, uh, I can answer, I have two responses on that. Um, the French pre former president, Nicolas Sarkozy, uh, launched a national debate on the question you asked. He asked all the officials, the, the mayors, the president of the district, the department, the prefet, to organize a debate on what it is to be French when he was, during his presidency. And my colleague, most of my colleagues said that's absolutely not the role of the politicians to decide who is French, what to be French, everybody can feel as can have an individual feeling of how to be French. And I decided, I was asked by the newspaper Le Monde to write an op-ed and I said, I cannot write it in one month, on one day and even in one month, I need a few months. And I wrote a long, they gave me one page that become a, a short book, uh, uh, Etre Francais, where based on my research, I was able to define what I call the four pillars of the French nationality. In fact, the idea of pillars can work with many countries. Let me make, make immediately a footnote. I, can, I just was in Bangladesh uh, in the spring for a lecture about comparative secularism. And while I visited the uh, Museum of the War of Liberation, where, who has invited me to make the lecture, I suddenly felt that the pillar of Bangladesh were exactly the same, almost the same than the French pillars. So let me give you the French pillars. First of all, there is the principle of equality. As you know, we have liberté, égalité, fraternité, but égalité is stronger than the two other, uh, I would say, principle. And that is a, a secularization of a very strong uh, dimension of Catholicism. Then we have the memory of the revolution, of the French revolution. That is, you can see it uh, when you follow French politics, because we are a people who demonstrate, who go in the street, who 
who contest permanently the constitution, the regime, etc. So it's, it's a long tradition. Then we have the language and the culture. There is very few countries where all the aspiration of the elite is to end in an academy where they do the French dictionary every week. And then you have laïcité, which is our regime of separation of church and state to whom everybody is attached without always agreeing on what it means. But it's a very strong uh, part of French identity. So here I mention, I would say, a historical sociological approach of what is to be, what is to be French that if you check with people, they would find it quite relevant and they would say, yes, and what is, and it's an open, all these pillars are open to new citizens. Nobody can be rejected. Nobody is rejected by equality, the memory of the revolution, the, the value of language and culture or laicity. It's absolutely open to a new citizen. And then you have, I would say, roughly speaking, some French people who feel that they are losing the country, the, the, they are not living in the same country than the one in which they were born. And they regret that, that, and they are voting for, I would say, extremist party on the right. And you have others who would say, I am French on paper, but I'm not feeling I am recognized as such by the rest of the population. So you have here, I would say, using Max Weber, you know, uh, frame, I have here two uh, categories of people who are French, but don't feel at ease uh, totally in the current situation of the country. Yes, and I'll pick up immediately on, on that point, uh, mentioning the catchword uh, banlieue and sort of the ghettoization of those who came to France and then were sort of, uh, if I can use the strong word, segregated on the outskirts of Paris. And there was that famous film, I don't remember the title of now, when uh, the, the, the young banlieusards uh, who are treated by police rather uh, strictly, if I can put it that way, and then they come to the center of Paris, to the Place de la Concorde or somewhere, and they say, wow, how nice the policemen are here in the center of Paris. What, what and how is the integration process in your uh, experience, because you've looked at other countries, how is the integration process compared to those in, in other countries? Is France a welcoming culture, as they like to say in Germany? Here, I would make again a difference between the data and the perception. Of course, uh, you are right, you had urban segregation, you have segregation on the, uh, or racism or discrimination on the labor market, but you have also, for the majority of the people who have, of the children, of the people who have come to France, from wherever they have come and all their children, a process of integration that's shown now in every domain of the public and private sector. Uh, and it shows, but not much on TV and not much as an event uh, to, to emphasize uh, the French integration successes. I mean, uh, I am part part-time in the US, in the US you have also segregation and you have, a, I mean, you have a lot of, even I think higher segregation, but there is a tendency to emphasize American dream and American success as in France you have a tendency to emphasize the French failures which exist. But there is another dimension which is, which is a dimension of perception. And that is, a, a, a political construction, a kind of paranoid and even complotist dimension 
of what's happening in the country, which is, I think, more important, more important than because you know the the the. You, I, I mean, I can come back on the data. The data are not so bad. The, what is very bad is the fact that we had two extreme right candidates in the last election who did a, a huge score, and Marine Le Pen increased a lot his score in the last, in the second round of the presidential election. And I would say she can win next time because the, the situation is extremely dangerous politically. So what is going on here? Well, when we talk about immigrants for in, in France, so many people talk about immigrants, they don't mean, they mean some of the people who are French. There are some people, they, they mention them as immigrants, uh, uh, because, but, but they are French, but they have an origin that is not the origin of their own origin of the old European stock. And they, what has happened in the last uh, decades is that since the 80s, there was an erroneous and conspirational narrative of the history of our immigration policy. According to this uh, factually wrong and false uh, narrative, in 1975, former President Giscard d'Estaing introduced a new family pro uh, reunification uh, law or decision. He opened, the, he opened, he created family reunification. So it's totally wrong because family reunification has existed in, in France since the origin of immigration to France at the end of the 19th century. But this narrative is shared by even, even scholars. Who, I have been one day, a few, two years ago, a few years ago, asked by four ma major historians to write an article on the diction, on, on the on, uh, encyclopedia of, of French history about the creation of family unification in 75. And people feel that they have not been part of the decision, that the decision uh, to become uh, open to immigration from North Africa and Africa it was decided by, by a secret uh, this, uh, authoritarian decision of Giscard d'Estaing. Can you imagine that when he died, Giscard d'Estaing, in December 2020, the, his, his uh, uh, eulogy in a very serious French radio, France Culture, the title was the father, Giscard d'Estaing, the father of family reunification, not a, 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 a European builder, not anything about. So there is this quasi obsession that reinforced the theory, have you, you have heard of this theory, of the great replacement, that there is a, a will, a, a plot, to replace the, the old French stock by the newcomers coming from, Af from Africa and North Africa. I would add another dimension of it. And, and you know, let to add something, this plot theory has not, well, you have it on the extreme right, there is a guy called Renaud, Renaud Camus, who is not a very strong political uh, public figure. But this theory has been developed in mainstream journals like Le Debat. Uh, I, and I quote, I can send you an article I wrote, uh, I was asked by Princeton uh, colleagues. And they have, they have started this theory that there is a plot, a Protestant plot, crazy article which was published, not in the extreme right, but in the mainstream journals. Even Bruno Latour, you all probably respect for his uh, incredible work on uh, the, 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 the issue of the, the future of the planet has, has, has had an op-ed on, on Le Monde in 1990 saying that it was the anti-racist that, that we are naturalizing race and the French people has the right to decide how many they want to be and which color of skin. That was written in Le Monde, not in a, not in. A, so you had this mainstream uh, 
figures who wrote about that. And this plot theory is reinforced by the legacy of Algerian war. I would say that in France, four different French group of French citizens have a trauma or have might have a trauma because of their Algerian past or Algerian inheritance. So you have the immigrants who, were, who fought for Algeria independence came to France or remain in France and have, their children have become French or they are even renaturalized. You have the pieds noirs who had to move to France. You have the Jews who are living, who are, Alger who are inhabitants of Algeria, then became French and had to leave also to France or to other countries. And, and uh, you have also the Muslim who fought with the French army called the Arki, uh, and who also have a very traumatic memory of, of but, uh, their treatment by the, by the Gaulle and the French government. And what's happening now is that this group have created, of course, have developed with families, etc. They are living in the country, all French citizens, but they are developing a kind of a kind of representation sometimes that what's happening now is a reproduction of the past. So for the uh, uh, one who are from Al uh, Algerian origin, they are living in a post-colonial who reproduce the colonization, the segregation, the racism uh, of the colonization. Uh, and I would say for the others that they are, feel, they are feeling that they are uh, threatened uh, on their right to uh, live uh, safely in the country. And all that has not been resolved by, uh, and that's what I want to end here. There is no counter narrative. There is no, there is an issue here of narrative that should, and it was the opposite that was made by the different French government including in policy. For example, they put the kids of immigrants in special classroom to be taught their language and their culture when there was a plan to send them back with their parents. But this, this program, uh, which were run by the country of origin, remained decades. So these kids were put outside of their, of their, uh, of their classroom. And then when it was clear that there would be Staying in France, what was introduced? Uh, history of religion. Of course, everybody understand it was not the history of Christianity that was the, the reason of the, this new program. It was about Islam. And it was a complete break with the tradition of the French school that teach political history and let religion in the private sphere, or the family is teaching whatever they want. Uh, and instead of teaching the history of slavery, abolition of slavery, of colonization and decolonization, which, which was the reason why you had that diversity in the classroom, that has been minor, not a total priority. It has become a little more now. But frankly, there have been big mistakes made by the main parties. I'm not attacking any, any of them uh, in particular by the mainstream parties. And what I want to say in conclusion, it is that you cannot fight a false narrative only by showing it's wrong, on, or, 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 or only by claiming that you need to respect the law and uh, liberal value. You need a counter narrative. Nation cannot live without narrative. People cannot live without narrative. And that is something it's not only my, I'm not the only one to say that, but I think it's sometimes very much forgotten by scholars. Thank you. Uh, and obviously for those of you who don't know the, the French history, what uh, I think Patrick Way was absolutely right to remind us uh, after the uh, end of the um, war uh, and the occupation of Algeria in 1962, there were a million 
uh, Algerians who came to France. Of course, uh, Patrick talked about the different categories, the Aki and others, but uh, there was a, a huge wave um, that was the result of the, of the Evian Accords that de Gaulle uh, signed. Um, before I open it up, uh, Patrick, let me ask you, uh, out of the many questions that, that rise from, from this topic, uh, for example, our colleague from Italy here said that actually there was more out-migration from Italy than immigration coming into Italy. Um, I suppose that that is not the case in France, but uh, given that France is not uh, on the front line of the Mediterranean crossings like Italy or Spain or Greece for that matter, or is <laughs> obviously not part of the Balkan route, how has, uh, well, two things. One, did, did the terrorist attacks in the 80s change the perception of what it meant to be a receiving country of migration? And secondly, um, we, we saw recently this spate between Italy and, and France. Where would this, this one of these boats land? And France decided after pressure from Italy that it should take in. What is the current situation on the, on the arrivals of uh, this uh, migration flow, and are the numbers being pumped up by the Marine Le Pens of this world, and are they in fact not as dramatic as some right-wing politicians would like to portray them? Thank you, Yvonne. That's a very important question, because in fact, data are, are used in the political debate. And I want to emphasize one thing, which is for which is, a, 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 I think, a, a, a big problem and completely neglected, even if it's a problem for all the European Union country who receive immigrants. Under the pressure, and I know what I'm talking about because I was the, the chairman of the st immigration statistics office of the French High Council for Integration who had the mission, the public mission to produce every year the statistics. And I, when I accepted this mission from Simone Weil, in fact, I was not related to her, but she was the president of this body and asked me to take, I had no imagination that what was happening in this uh, field at the French and European level. But I would say, and let's me. I, 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 I really. I know that I am on record, and I say it. That on record, some demographers who are not the most open to migration pressured the European Union to change the way or to regulate the way we should count our immigrants. And what has happened is that since two thousand seven. We have had, we had, we were forced, the French government was forced because they approved. In fact, it was an, there was a unanimity requirement and they signed it to, to include students in the numbers. And the students are, are one third of the numbers. Imagine in the US, the student would be two thirds of the number if they were added in, in, instead of having one million green, I mean, there would be three million. And if imagine if, if suddenly the numbers rise of one third in, and nobody explained to you why. And the, and the huge majority of the student goes back, don't stay in the country. And for those who are staying, they were counted when they would marry or when they would become workers, they would be counted as a new immigrant workers of, of immigrant family, but there was, there is now a situation that is awful in terms of perception. Let me give you a story. We often compare Europe to Canada, and in many countries we compare to Canada. But you know how Canada counts the family, the family migration? When it's a family of a worker, they are counted as workers. When it's a family of refugee, they are counted as refugee. When it, in Europe, all families are counted together as family. So if you add the families that give the impression that you know, there is a population migration, 
And then you add the students. I would say that the European statistics, especially in the European country, who have a lot of foreign students, have exploded uh, because of the new this new way of counting or legal migration. So that's my, a first point, which I think is very much neglected and should require that we lobby for an harmonization of the way big country of immigration count the migrant. I mean, North America and Europe should come together and count the same way. And it was a proposal of OECD, a great frame that was rejected by the European Union that as the way we count immigrants is to the benefit of the most populist and anti-immigrant forces everywhere in Europe. And I, I, I am happy that you gave me the opportunity to make that statement. The, 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 the second thing I want to say is, is that you pointed a very important issue, the relation between France and its European neighbors. I, I claim in the most recent interview I gave about the new bill that is presented in the parliament by the government, that this bill is missing. The most important thing is that there is no more national policy without a permanent connection with uh, working with the neighbors. And for France is even more important because within the Schengen agreement and the Dublin agreement, you might think should be revised, but they are still the law of Europe. The first country, the country where you land, or the country you has the responsibility of treating the cases of asylum or the cases of undocumented migration. And it is one of the reasons why the Schengen Agreement was approved by the right wing government of our time, of the previous time, by Charles Pasqua, who was the Minister of Interior, because it gives responsibility of managing most of the flows coming to France, to Germany, Italy, Spain, etc. But when Italy, for example, doesn't stamp the, the documents uh, when people arrive and, and advise, uh, even sometimes give the ticket to go directly to France, and then the people arrive, that's a problem. And that's the situation, in fact, that and I would mention here Macron because he gave a very, he wrote a very, very good op-ed, uh, January 2nd, uh, 1917, uh, 2017, before he was elected, saying we need to cooperate with Italy and Germany to manage together these flows when they arrive, it's the, the people when they arrive, etc. And he did the opposite when he became president. He humiliated the Italian government, which was a center left government at that time, by dealing directly with the Libyan and Niger situation. And we, you never had any cooperation. And this cooperation is absolutely needed. And as it cannot come from the cooperation at the 27 members level, it has to come with the West part of Europe, where you have this issue of managing together the, the flow. So that's my, my, my response to your question. Thank you very much, Patrick. Many more questions, but I'll open it up for the floor. And uh, there are some questions uh, from our online viewers. Exactly, yes. Um, there are several questions from the chat. Um, the first two actually are from uh, Isabel. Uh, she would like to know if the if there were any significant changes uh, in the integration and immigration policies in France um, in the past several years, especially after the events like uh, the refugee crisis of 2015 and 16, a wave of terrorist attacks and, uh, attacks and now the war in U Ukraine. Um, the second question, you were talking about the counter narrative uh, against, uh, which is needed against the popul uh, populism. Um, what would this counter narrative consist of, in your opinion? And then there's also a third question in the chat. I have to find it. Renate wants to know um, if we know more about the educational and professional backgrounds of migrants. Thank you. Um, 
So the as there are some changes uh, in terms of uh, the immigration policy itself, uh, there is a frame that has not been changed. There is that. There is a respect of asylum. It is a European frame. You respect asylum. Uh, you respect the right of family unification under certain condition of housing and, and resources. And there is, there was, I would say, but, and there is the right to admit whatever number of workers you want. And there is, there have been a tendency that I would say the rise of permit for work and the decline of asylum uh, rights. And the, the new bill introduced by Macron's government, if the bill passes, which is not true, true, would change. We had a very, I would say, remarkable um, legal regime of the asylum recognition, which is we have an office who decide yes or no, and then there, you have an appeal, which is possible, uh, in front of a court of three people, one representative of the administrative Supreme Court, one representative of the French government, and one representative of the UNHCR. So we had the UN, we have the UNHCR in our appeal court, which has, which is great because they know the world situation. They have, so there is this kind of incredible process, and the government now want to suppress this appeal court, and they want to have only one judge to this. And I wrote in this interview that. To decide the life or death of some one, some people is better to be three than one, especially when the one will be representative of the government and not anymore even of the courts. So that's the bill which is pending now in the parliament, but I hope will be uh, amended by the parliamentary process. In some ways, this is a sign of the failure of the European cooperation, I was mentioning earlier, uh, this, the, the impact of the asylum crisis, the, the, the Syrian asylum crisis was clear. Remember Manuel Valls was prime minister who went to Munich and say, we should not welcome this. It's very uh, 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 challenging Merkel, Chancellor Merkel, for having admitted. Because of what I told you about the, our narrative, etc., the French prime minister could go, which is completely uh, insane in some way, and challenge on the territory of Germany uh, the, the chancellor for her openness to refugees. And we didn't open our doors much. Uh, for the to the Syrian refugee for the reason I I told you about and in fact uh, so we open our doors to the Ukrainian and but all this management is linked not to the terrorist attack of the 80s which were part of the or the 90s which was part of the consequence of the civil war in Algeria, but of the attack uh, of the of the Charlie Hebdo attack of the November 2015 attack of the beheading of the teacher, and so the the fear of Islamism, not of Islam, but but sometimes for some people it it, it is there is a terrible association between both, but it is that that has informed, I would say that informs part of the reaction of the French government towards uh, on the issue you, you asked me about. Uh, the second question was, uh, what, is, what could be the counter narrative? So the counter narrative is, first of all, going back to the facts. 
even if the fact by themselves uh, uh, sometimes are not enough. But for example, let me speak about the narrative about uh, slavery and abolition of slavery. There was a, a recent debate, which was incredible in my, in, in my uh, view. There was the, the Minister of Interior went to Guadeloupe and attacked uh, in, a, in a debate with the local elected people saying, the, the, you, should, you are not in the same situation than Caledonia where it was colonization. Here, the, the French Republic abolished slavery, et cetera. Et cetera. And then they, they said, no, it's not the French Republic who abolished slavery. It is a, a revolt of the slave who, who created the abolition, etc. The truth is in the middle. The truth is that it's true that the French Republic in 1794, the first in the world, abolished slavery because of the revolt of the slave, yes, but in the context of the French Revolution. And then when Napoleon reestablished slavery, the first act of the new the second French Republic in 1848 was again to abolish slavery and even declared it a crime against humanity and punished it with the penalty of deprivation of citizenship. But it's, 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 both, it's the same. It was the, the, the revolt, the movement of the slave, etc. That, but also the act of the leader of the republic against the monarchy or the empire, who were pro, who are against, absolutely against slavery. And for example. Schulcher, you might not know, who uh, uh, wrote uh, the report to abolish slavery immediately in 1848, faced Tocqueville. Tocqueville was not in favor of an immediate abolition of slavery. And so you have, so instead of opposing these two narratives, you just say, the truth is that abol abolition would not have happened without the revolt of the slave, but it would not have happened so early or at that moment without allies of the slave, people who were against, who were not slave and were against slavery. That ex it's, this movement exists. And you have the same story uh, about the colonization. Of course, the revolt of the colonized people played a major role in decolonization, but also the political forces who existed within the French, the British, the, the American, the European societies against colonization. And I, when I was teaching uh, one class one year at, at Yale Law School, I taught it two years about the history of human rights. You can, one can notice that human rights, when you vote on human rights, you get 20% of people supporting human rights. So the human rights fighter needs allies. They never win alone. And so that is a story you can, I, I give you an example of a narrative where you show that yes, there was discrimination in the past. There were even crime against humanity with slavery, uh, uh, crime against equality with colonization, but there was fight, there was victorious fight. And that is the, the narrative that is the, tr the true story and that unify people or some people, instead of dividing them and making them enemy in, 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 a, in, a, in our living society. Okay, let's, uh, we have about 10, 15 minutes more. Uh, obviously, as you can also ask Melita Shunic, who uh, gave us the introductory talk. Um, so yeah, uh, did I see some hands? Yes, both. Yeah, uh, Rainer first, and then. Okay. okay I'll... Hello, Patrick. Uh, Hello, Rainer. So uh, you talked about uh, French non-cooperation with other European countries on migration routes, but one country you didn't mention, where there is now a current crisis, is uh, the UK. The UK is no longer in the EU. It's not bound by Schengen and Dublin. 
uh, but it's, uh, the main debate there is currently about boat people crossing over the channel from France. Uh, and uh, the complaint on the UK side is that France doesn't cooperate. It doesn't take people back. Uh, uh, and uh, so the UK had to come up instead with a weird solution that is now becoming a model for Europe, which is Rwanda. Fly them out to Rwanda and have the, the asylum claims process there. And if they are successful, they have a right to stay in Rwanda. Now, uh, I'm just wondering, what should be the French policy on uh, this uh, boat uh, people crossing over from France? And uh, it, I find it also amazing, and I've always wondered about this, why would they think that their main dest that the only destination they want to get to is Britain? Uh, very few of them actually are happy with staying in France. Uh, so that tells you a story about how maybe France is not the most attractive country for many people on these migration routes. Well, let's take the second question immediately and then Patrick can answer both of them. Yeah, maybe it, it's, a, um, it's more uh, a comment than a question, but I was thinking about the, this, this excellent idea that you had about uh, the narrative and how, what would be the, the, the counter narrative. And then, of course, a, a counter narrative to the, to the current narrative of immigration not working, integration not working, and so on, and, and politicians incapable of, of, uh, of, of, of um, dealing with that appropriately. I think we, we've seen something which has been quite amazing this year or last year, uh, which, is, which is the refugee situation uh, from Ukraine. And the fact that um, uh, millions of people could enter the European Union as they pleased and uh, distribute themselves across Europe as they wanted uh, and were welcomed, uh, more or less, I would say, with open arms everywhere. And I think that is such a powerful counter-narrative, but, but people don't, at least the policymakers, I don't see them making the connection. They see that as something completely different. The, so when we talk about uh, migration and borders now, like in the European Council last, last week, um, there is this concern about an increase in the number of irregular arrivals and an increase of asylum applications. Well, but, but actually that should be a footnote uh, in quantitative, quantitative terms compared to the fact that we have received millions of Ukrainian uh, refugees without any major uh, problems. So, so uh, this, this, this unique or this, this new uh, refugee situation is framed as something different with has not, nothing to do with the rest of our problems. And I think sometimes we should make that connection and say, well, this is an example of how uh, uh, a war can force people to flee and also an example how uh, when political will is mobilized uh, and if politicians also uh, uh, sell that uh, to people that can be handled quite well uh, in the European Union. Okay, thanks. Back to you, Patrick. I will answer the last question first. I think the response is that, uh, first of all, the, I mean, the Ukrainian war has created, I would speak for France, but I think it's the same in any Western European country, the feeling of a sharing destiny with Eastern Europe at a point that had never existed in my life. I would say this, this uh, it was, yes, there was an enlargement of Europe, which was legal and formal, but the feeling of, be, of a common destiny and belonging. It's not finished, I mean, it is still to be built, but there is this feeling that has, and also there was in this political situation and, mili and war situation, I think the European neighbors the, the feel, what can we do? What can we do? It is a political response and welcome refugee, it's at least what we can do, it's not perhaps much. We are not fighting with, or with, with arms and guns, but at least we can help the population. And I think, I would say that I can see in my country that when you have the news of what's going on under the Taliban in Afghanistan, people are much, open their, their arms to Afghan refugee more than when there was not this situation of the Taliban ruling. And I think 
it, it, it means something, political refugee. The people are, op are more open to migration, which is in response of a terrible political crisis, uh, then to the to what you just mentioned, the illegal migration that comes without this connection they can make. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but the connection, if they if it's not obvious or if it's not in the headlines, they don't see it and they don't associate the arrival with the political situation that justify the status of refugee. It's why this connection that exists in the mind of the people should never be suppressed as some academics and government are doing by banalizing the status of, of refugees, saying it's the same that immigrants. No, it is one of the, of the opening. It's not totally open, but it's still there. And so to now go to, the, to Rainer's question, the paradoxical situation with the UK is that at least we are in an agreement with the UK. We have the 2K agreement that is permanently on the, on the stress, but there is, the issue is on the table. Everybody talk about it. I mean, the government, the French government, the French talk about it, which is not the case between France and Italy or France and Spain or France and Germany. Very rarely you hear that, you know, between France and the UK because of the borders, we talk about it. So there is a cooperation uh, higher than people think between the French and, and the British, not of course a cooperation for opening the, it's a rep, rep, I mean, there is a lot of cooperation of the British police in French, in New Calais, et cetera, et cetera. So what could be the answer here? It makes me come back to what I say. The French should manage Calais with, the, 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 with Italy, with Germany, with Spain, because of course these people are with Belgium because these people has arrived. Not, very rarely directly to France, they have arrived through other countries. And so it's why there is an urgency to manage these spots, Calais, uh, the Sicilia, Sicile, and space together, and to create new rules of cooperation where we can offer and manage, offer a, a place to live to these people who arrive or those who deserve this right and others should be managed to be sent back, but the, 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 the management should be shared because we cannot, we cannot manage Calais alone and the Italian cannot manage their border alone. And it's time to organize a co of the cooperation of the willing countries who want to cooperate on this issue uh, 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 and, to, and to help each other manage, manage the situation and associate the UK to the management because they are they can be associated to special projects. Patrick, thank you uh, very much uh, for your insights and the answers to your questions. We are going to draw this uh, morning uh, in Vienna uh, uh, and this uh, virtual meeting uh, to a close. So um, I'm supposed to give some concluding marks, which is virtually impossible, but I will uh, draw on uh, Melita Shunic's very uh, good metaphor, uh, come to Europe by yacht and not by boat. Uh, <laughs> with a lot of money on that yacht and you will get European citizenship. But uh, the metaphor continues that in fact, as, as Patrick was just saying, we are all in the same boat. And if we do not get our act together, and think more longer term, we will be constantly in short termism, like we saw at the European Council on February 9th, where politicians for short term gain, looking to their next elections, are proposing the usual close the borders, fortress Europe, you know, and uh, we'll deal uh, with this in the way that our voters, or rather the way in which we suppose our voters will be happy with us, and in fact, we're just kicking the can down the road. Uh, I was just saying during the break, 
uh, and again, uh, some of Melita's suggestions, you know, we need to deal with the root causes. Yes, absolutely. And I was saying Angela Merkel during her tenure went to Africa about six, seven times to kind of try and see how one deals with the root causes. This was just skimming the surface. And so we're far away from, uh, you know, is it called reforming Dublin or wh whatever it's called? But uh, we're, we're not out of the woods. In fact, we're very much in them. And so hopefully, you know, a step-by-step -step approach comes thanks to uh, the experts that we have had here. Hopefully we'll be able to influence policies and, and move forward. So thank you to all our speakers. Thank you to those of you who are in the room. And of course, to our uh, virtual uh, audience um, who have been with us. And I will pass the floor to uh, Mirja Natomic, who is, of course, the uh, person who uh, devises all this in partnership with our uh, organizations who have done this. So, Mirja. Now. I only want to say two sentences. I want to thank everybody for coming, to all the speakers. And what I have learned today, uh, since I'm not an academic, is that Europe is incre inc uh, incredibly diverse. And, uh, you know, I'm not really sure it's welcoming to anybody. And uh, uh, I'm too old to go to a new country. But if I had to migrate again, I'd probably go to Canada. Uh, where they will not be telling me about their history and uh, about uh, national traumas. It will be welcoming. But still, I decided to stay in Europe, so, uh, and I think we are all Europeans, so one should have some sort of a long-term vision how to incorporate everyone who came here and will be coming. I thank you all. Thank you, Mia.